What happened to E3? In the run-up to E3 2019, the Electronic Entertainment Expo was generating an average of $30 million annually. Now, the Expo has been cancelled for the fourth year in a row. When asked whether E3 would return in 2024, ESA President Stanley Pierre-Louis gave the following non-answer. We're committed to providing an industry platform for marketing and convening, but we want to make sure we find the right balance that meets the needs of the industry. We are certainly going to be listening and ensuring whatever we want to offer meets those needs, and at that time, we will have more news to share. What then has killed the most recent incarnation of E3, and what will the Expo look like when, or if, it returns? While disruption caused by the COVID-19 pandemic led to the Expo's cancellation in 2020, E3's problems started long before this. The previous year, one of E3's longest supporters, Sony, elected not to attend. Other large companies had already begun to limit their presence at the show. Nintendo, for example, had opted not to give presentations at E3 since 2013, in favour of a booth on the show floor combined with Nintendo Direct presentations directly to consumers. The challenge that E3 has faced in recent years has come down largely to the ways the video game industry has shifted dramatically in the YouTube era. So you could say that we killed E3? Well, not us. Maybe Game Explain. It's worth bearing in mind where E3 came from and what it was originally designed to do. The Expo started in 1995, and grew out of the Tech Expo, CES. As noted by the Washington Post, in the early 1990s, to access the video game section of the Consumer Electronics Show, CES, in Las Vegas, attendees had to walk through the convention centre, toward the back of the hall, past the adult entertainment section, and go out the back door to a large tent set up in the parking lot. There were porta potties and there was no real food. Former Sega of America CEO Tom Kalensky recalls, right over the Sega display, there was a leak at the top of the tent, and so water was dripping down on my new Genesis 16-bit machines. And I basically said to everybody, okay, that's it, we're never coming back here again, we're gonna have our own show. E3, then, was posited as the video game answer to CES, a show primarily designed for companies to market products to investors, retailers and journalists. It was at the first E3 that Sony of America President Steve Race made one of the most famous presentations in the history of the games industry. Taking to the main stage for what had been billed as a brief presentation, he simply said, $2.99, and left the stage. This was the retail price for the upcoming Sony PlayStation a hundred dollars cheaper than the Sega Saturn. Journalists in attendance lapped this up, reporting how Sony had dunked on Sega. The media reports of this keynote speech would go on to inform the weird tonal balancing act that E3 has attempted to keep ever since. Since its inception, E3 has attempted to be all things to all people. For retailers, investors and business partners, there are dry financial presentations. For traditional journalists, there are special events designed to curry favour and ensure more favourable media coverage. As reports of these events gained notoriety, regular consumers have shown increasing interest in attending E3 as well, as social media platforms including YouTube have become the primary means through which gaming news spreads. According to New York University historian of video games, Lane Nooney, the idea used to be that Conventions like E3 were the place to deliver glowing keynotes about the next generation of product. The Expo exerted a magnetic effect by drawing everyone into the same place over a small period of time, creating a flurry of news coverage. But many companies have discovered it's just as effective to create tailored video launches designed for circulation through social media. In 2006, amid fears that E3 attendance was becoming diluted by too many regular consumers and armchair journalists, the Expo was drastically scaled back. This, though, proved unpopular, and since then the show has increasingly catered to the widest possible audience. With a presence at E3 costing millions of dollars, and with the audience at the Expo shifting to cater more to average consumers, many games companies have decided that the show simply isn't worth it. 
In the words of Kotaku's Luke Plunkett, Why on earth would any major company want to risk being a gladiator? Why would they look at a scenario where the success of their billion dollar enterprise could be threatened by some kids deciding a game trailer or new hardware feature was meh? Why would they bother sitting down with games press to answer questions when they could just send out press releases? This sentiment was likely exacerbated when it was announced that ESA was partnering with ReadPop for future E3 shows. ReadPop operates of <laughs> ReadPop operates events like PAX and various MCM Comic Cons around the world, and is primarily focused on consumers rather than traditional journalism or industry professionals. Said Stanley Pierre Louis, Historically, E3 served as an industry platform to make announcements about games products and services, as well as an opportunity for business to get done. Over the years, even as consumers were invited to participate in E3, the event focused largely on the industry's marketing and business needs. So when we decided to bring back E3 in person for 2023, we knew that it would have to reflect those changing needs. That's what made working with ReadPop an ideal situation. It seems, though, that while ReadPop is very good at squeezing money out of regular attendees, this was likely taken by games companies as a sign that the already antiquated gaming expo was drifting further from its original intended purpose. According to Pierre-Louis, We were off to a strong start. There was interest among exhibitors, industry players, media, and certainly the fans. Ultimately, however, there were challenges that proved too large to surmount. First, several companies have reported that the timeline for game development has been altered since the start of the COVID pandemic. Second, economic headwinds have caused several companies to reassess how they invest in large marketing events. And third, companies have started to experiment with how to find the right balance between in-person events and digital marketing opportunities. Christopher Dring, a journalist for GamesIndustry.biz, which is owned by ReadPop, was privy to many of the conversations happening behind the scenes. He summed up the failed convention thusly. And at the start, oh, that glorious start, it seemed so positive. Companies were talking about taking up huge spaces, the E3 team was looking at how we could expand into the car park and use the extra areas that hadn't been used for years. Back then, all bar one of the big games companies were enthusiastic about the return of E3. Or at least, they said they were. Or at least, their events teams said they were. As the months dragged on and contracts remained unsigned, the mood changed. And they gave good reasons for pulling out. Our games aren't ready. We don't have code. We can't be seen to be extravagant in this economy. The timing isn't quite right. And so on. It doesn't matter how true those reasons were, it all amounts to the same thing. The games industry didn't want it after all. Thus, the 2023 E3 has been cancelled, as the companies involved reassess what E3's role in the gaming industry will be moving forward. It's unlikely that such a potent cultural touchstone, and such a big moneymaker for the ESA, will remain dormant for long. If and when E3 does return, though, it's likely to be a very different experience. The challenge with E3 over the years has always been the same. How to meet the needs of everyone in attendance at the same time. The moral of the story, then, is that you can't please everyone. Hello there, KOTOR the artist here. I just wanted to say a word about the commissions I'm offering. Thank you so much to those of you who've purchased a commission thus far. We're up to nearly a quarter of the cost of the new camera I need to buy for my day job. Thank you. For anyone else who might be interested, over on my coffee store I'm selling personalised avatar portraits and derpy animal pictures. Hopefully the camera I need to buy will also benefit this channel, so if you can, please consider purchasing a commission. Thank you very much for watching.